Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm Cynthia Lowen, a member of the Producers Guild of America. The Producers Guild is a nonprofit trade organization with offices in Los Angeles and New York. The Producers Guild represents and promotes the interests of all members of the producing team in film, television, and new media. I would like to welcome you all to this PGA webinar presented by the PGA's Diversity and Inclusion Committee called the Future of Producing Crime and Law Enforcement Programs. If you'd like to participate in today's session by submitting questions, please do so by utilizing the Q&A feature, um, which is a button that you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Our moderator will save the last 10 minutes of the presentation for audience questions. I am now delighted to turn this over to moderator Shelby Stone, who will introduce herself and the panelists and kick this off. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, hi, I'm Shelby Stone. I am a proud member of the Producers Guild. I've been a working producer and or production executive forever. <laughs> And I was very honored to have the PGA ask me to moderate this panel. Um, I'm going to briefly introduce each of the panelists and let them talk about uh, a little bit about themselves and their career, and then we'll get into a conversation. Um, I'm going to start with Marilyn Ness, who's a documentary filmmaker uh, of a great movie called Charm City, among others. Hey, thanks, Shelby. Um, yeah, so I'm a doc primarily a documentary producer. I've worked on films including Becoming, the recent Michelle Obama doc, and Trapped by Don Porter, and Camera Person by Kirsten Johnson. But I directed and was one of the producers of Charm City, which um, set out to follow three uh, to follow police and citizens and uh, government officials during three years in Baltimore when the city was experiencing violence and there was a lot of unrest between um, police and citizens. And so that's the that's the film that brought me to this panel today. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Gina Prince Bythewood, who's a writer, director, producer. I don't know, there's kind of nothing she can't do. Um, Gina, do you want to say something about yourself? Hey, um, what's about myself? Uh, I started in television, started in sitcoms. Different World was my first uh, gig in the industry. Um, absolutely set the tone for my career given it was run by three black women. And so going to work every day with that uh, was my normal. And as I said, really set the tone of, of where I knew I could go. Um, stayed in TV for five years before quitting to do uh, my first feature, Love and Basketball, and continued to make features. Um, came back to television to do the limited series Shots Fired with my husband, uh, writer, producer, director, Reggie Rock Bythewood. Um, compelled to do that show for a, a number of reasons, but absolutely um, what we saw um, out in the world with the murders, um, constant murders of us by law enforcement. And now recently, uh, my film, The Old Guard, was just released on Netflix on Friday. And I think that and Shots Fired have brought me here today. Oh, yes. Uh, and I recommend The Old Guard. I love a good action movie, and it's great. So thank you so much for agreeing to participate. Um, then I wanted to go to Aaron Rashad Thomas, who's a great showrunner, writer, producer, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks for having me. Um, definitely check out the old guard. It's dope. Um, what brings me here? I got my start in in TV, coming off of um, out of film school at USC, and I was able to get my start actually as an intern, writer's assistant on Soul Food, the series. We're pretty much an all black staff. That was my introduction to TV. Since then, I've been able to write on staff such as uh, Friday Night Lights. Police procedurals like Numbers, CSI New York, show called Southland, the Regina King. And then uh, I was able to wrote on a show called The Get Down on Netflix about the origin of hip hop in New York. And then I decided to create my own uh, police procedural starring Shamar Moore that's currently on CBS, that's SWAT. And we're currently breaking season four with the hope of shooting uh, pretty soon. 
um, if, if it's God's willing. So um, that's what brings me here. Thank you. Um, and last but never least is the president of an amazing organization called Color for Change. I recommend if you don't know it, please go online. They do amazing work. I'll let you introduce yourself, Rashad. Thanks for having me. Um, Color of Change is a next generation civil rights organization um, that I'm the president of. And we believe in um, policy change and culture change. And we um, have an office in Hollywood and have worked for years to connect the work we're doing around racial justice on the ground all around the country to do the type of narrative change work that we know um, helps to build empathy, helps to build momentum for change, helps to um, create more openings for the stories um, that we know um, can uh, shape the reality that we all get to live in. And one of the things that we've done over the last couple of years is combine our work inside of writer's rooms, combine our work at pushing the industry with a series of reports. Race in the Writer's Room in 2017 was with UCLA and really looked at sort of the representation, both qualitative and quantitative of um, inside of write, writer's rooms and looked at that. And then we recently released in January, Normalizing Injustice with USC Norman Lear School, where we looked at crime procedurals. Um, the organization is driven by over 7 million members, black folks and our allies of every race. And so at the heart of our work is being able to translate the presence that black people have in the world into the power to change rules. That's great. So that's, we have a, we're really, really blessed on this panel to have um, two of the most extraordinary showrunners of color. Um, and this great study that you did, Rashad, and Color with Color to Change, and then Marilyn's experience in terms of being an embedded filmmaker in a deeply complicated socio-political time in a city. So, um, I would love to kind of start with Gina talking about the old guard and your deep commitment, you and your husband, to being disruptors of the status quo, which is something, you know, that, that I think is part of what the, the end result of Rashad's study is. So just if you talk a little bit about your the way you go about, say, with Old Guard or Shots Fired or any of these amazing projects, where where is your core of your approach and your relationship with the gatekeeper executives? Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, all of us on this panel are disruptors given who we center in our work. Um, it, it really starts there. That is, that is the protest. That is what is different. Um, and we center Black folks. Um, I think the body of my work is centering Black women who absolutely um, have been, it's really, it's really two things. The, the images that have been put out by Hollywood uh, have been so dangerous to who we are and in the images and weaponizing our Blackness, but it's also the invisibility, which is equally dangerous um, that has happened certainly with Black women, um, but Black folks in general. And it's that combination um, is a deadly combination because um, people are not able to see our humanity through uh, media, through television, through film. And film and TV are so powerful. They can absolutely change perception, absolutely shift culture. Um, and it's gonna take decades to undo what has been done for decades. But um, for me, for my husband, I know again for, for um, others on the panel, it is really centering people who look like us um, up on screen. It is amazing when you get to see yourself reflected, how that can affect your life. And with Old Guard is, you know, it's a, a film in the comic book superhero genre. And you think about how many, you know, little white boys get to grow up and see themselves a hundred different ways in this space. And so you grow up believing that you can be a hero. Um, I distinctly remember right before Black Panther came out, um, I took my two boys to see, uh, I won't say the name, but a Marvel film, which they loved. But my older one said flat out, why am I not a superhero? And for me, I'm a filmmaker, I'm an artist. I was like, damn, why am I not giving that to my child? Um, so it was really at that point 
to start making definitive steps to move into the genre that is so popular and so big and, and again, movies that I love, but I want to see myself reflected. I want my boys to be able to see themselves reflected. And um, the organic diversity that Old Guard has is something I'm very proud of. It was embedded in the graphic novel that it's based on, which I love, but um, it went further in that, in that those who I cast, it's not just, you know, if you have a project just, oh, let me just make this character black. You have to go further than that and let them be truthful and authentic um, to the culture. And I mean, I think a perfect example, again, I don't want to blow anybody out. I won't give the name of the movie, but there's a very popular movie um, where there was one black character, a lead, but she had no black friends. She <laughs> wasn't dating anybody black. We didn't meet her family. It was like, so what was the point as opposed to, you know, Niall um, in the old guard, I was so specific about her character and her backstory, I was specific about her hair and why she has cornrows. I mean, there was, all, there was so much thought about who she is. And uh, that's what really has to happen is, is allow, allow your characters of color um, to be true to the culture and allow us to tell our stories authentically uh, and truthfully. Yeah, I have to say it was such a joy to watch the Charlize Theron character and Niall, like the, their interaction and just that very complicated intra-female multi-generational interaction in the midst of a movie that you never see that in, right? Mm -hmm. You see those dramas, you never see those in your superhero kind of movies. It was a joy. And just out of curiosity, because it felt like Netflix I don't know. Was Netflix as supportive as, as was it? Were there, were there any struggles there in doing what you wanted to do? No. <laughs> and, you know this. You know it's interesting. I mean, this film was originally supposed to be at a studio, um, but the studio there was some trepidation. I'll use the word two females at the head of this, where Netflix was actively looking for a film with two females at the head of it. And that that's the difference. You go where you're wanted and they stepped up with money and stepped up with support and absolutely zero pushback um, and really embraced the vision of making this, you know, look like the world that, that I want to see. That's, that's great. That makes me very, I mean, I'm sorry that the other studio didn't have the vision, but you know, this is where we're moving. Like, this is what is just and right and equally entertaining as the same old, same old. Yeah. So that's really, that makes me very happy to hear that they were, were that they were down from the count. Um, so I would love to talk a little bit to uh, Marilyn about your experience on Charm City. I mean, you've made so many documentaries about really thorny issues. Um, from women's issues to, you know, Charm City, which is trying to understand these complexities. So I'd love it if you talk a bit about your process, what you discovered um, on that movie. Yeah, uh, so we, we waited in, it was late 2014. We were seeing all of these high profile murders in police custody, but in social media clips on loop. And we wondered if you went day in, day out, and what documentary filmmakers can do really well is go into a place and stay there for a really long period of time and just film the day in and day out, which um, I think people weren't seeing in neighborhoods where people were being excessively policed and with police officers who, were, who had a long history of abuse, which was the Baltimore Police Department. And so we managed to get the Baltimore Police Department to say yes to us. Um, I actually have no doubt it was because I was white that they said yes to me. Um, and so what can you do when you have that privilege of being able to enter that space? And so we were really thoughtful about representation. We knew we wanted a film on the community side to uh, people who felt and are excessively policed um, and then with police officers and not have them have to interact though they did, but we were gonna be in two separate worlds and then figure out how to sew that together in the city. And so on the community side, we wound up filming with to really just remarkable community heroes. There's no better way to say it. An older guy named Mr. C who runs a community center in a completely disinvested part of East Baltimore. And then his young protege, Alex Long, who in the course of the film becomes 
a violence interrupter. They use safe streets in Baltimore. And we were really intentional about not showing the things the news always goes in and films for 30 seconds or two minutes and leaving. We went and found people who were trying to do better in their own neighborhoods and lift everybody up. And they did all kinds of community groups and programs. And I don't want to give it away for people who haven't seen Mr. C, but Alex goes through some real tremendous hardship in the film and just um, his community lifts him up and holds him up and makes sure that he's going to survive this in a really exceptional way that just doesn't ever get seen. Um, but if you spend three years with real people and you invite them into your process, and he's a, he was a full, Alex was a full collaborator in the film, when the camera came, when the camera didn't. Um, and I worked with um, a cinematographer, Andre, Long, uh, Andre Lambertson, who's from Baltimore, originally um, African-American, and he was a producer as well. So he alone decided when the camera went on and off so that those choices were not being made by me. Um, and then on the police side, uh, we had a Baltimore crew filming with the police and we accepted, well, two things. We accepted one that they were, we were never going to get in with a, with a unit. We were in a particular police district with patrol officers. We were never getting in to film the corruption. That was just gonna escape our camera by default. Like they were gonna make sure that happened. Um, and so how do you, what do you film um, so that you can see the, the day in and day out of what they're up against? Um, and we, we work really diligently to not do the cops approach, like even thinking about what cameras we were bringing in or how we filmed the cars. We were interested in what it meant to be a human being doing that work, not the like the run and gun and get out of your car. And, and it made for what wound up being a really complicated, Shelby, thank you for noting, like a really complex portrait of people believing they're going out to do this work, but you could just watch it play out on screen all the ways that it is systemically unjust and unfair. And, and even why are cops going to this call in the first place? Why is a cop being sent to mediate an argument between a grandfather and their grandson was one of the calls we were on. And so we, we did, we, by not um, doing the procedural method of like, we have to follow a case from beginning to end, it meant you could follow the people. And I think then once we juxtaposed what it meant to be a community member living in this place and a police officer working in this place against one another, it's just crystal clear that they're swimming in the same completely broken system. Um, and you can start to, I mean, solutions are other people's job. I'm a filmmaker, but you can start to see what's not evident in the day in and day out of how other people are living. Most of us, or most of people like me are living. And so that's what we felt we could contribute to the conversation with Charm City. Great. Um, and for you, and I, I mean this with the utmost respect, but obviously you're coming into a community that, you know, is not your native community. So what was your approach with that? Um, I mean, so we really were really thoughtful about who was on the team and what their roles were on the team and that people had authority. Because I'm... As a producer, I think I, I am all about the collaborative sport that is documentary filmmaking, and I only sometimes step into the directing role, and I knew I had something very particular I was trying to show by just letting the world kind of unfold in front of the camera. So we were very intentional about who, who filmed, who had the right to turn the camera on and off. Um, deep, many, many, three months of being with the subjects before we ever brought a camera. So they could look me in the eye, because as soon as you bring a camera, that ends to some extent. Look me in the eye, ask me what we're talking about. We were up front with um, the guys on Rose Street that we were filming with the police. And we were up front with the police that we were filming in Baltimore, but we never, and we had two separate crews actually, so that the police could never track us because our crew was somewhere, the crew that was normally with them was somewhere else. So we put a lot of protocols in place to just keep everyone and their confidentiality safe. Um, and then, you know, and then when you spend three years with people and you live through their heartache and their grief and re in real time, right? Like you're there and terrible things happen. Um, you know, you just, I mean, I'd like to think all human beings would feel this way, but you become incredibly responsible for how you're portraying them and what the representations are. And then not all documentary filmmakers do this, but we did show the film before it was finished um, brought them in to each of the subjects, four separate screenings, the longest day of my life, the community guys, the individual patrol officers, the senior command staff of the police, and then 
Councilman Brandon Scott, who is now probably the mayor elect of Baltimore, homegrown hero there. Um, I showed it to each of them and said, you know, the edit is not done. So if we've gotten anything grievously wrong, this is your chance. And to a person, they all said it represented their true, true experience. And that was the first time they ever really saw what we were doing in the other parts of town that they didn't know about. So. Interesting. That's great. That's, it's very powerful. Your movie is very powerful. Um, all right. I wanted to, to dovetail over to Rashad. Um, I'm going to save Aaron for last because I think Rashad, you're, if you want to talk a little bit more about your findings about, it sort of touched on what Gina talked about, which is if we're not seen, if we're not, our human experience isn't part of the entertainment experience, then it's very easy to make people of color and anyone other into uh, monsters. And since people don't really read, they don't seem to know history, the portrayals of women and people of color and LGBTQ plus comes off of what people watch and what popular entertainment is. And that seemed, you really got at the heart of something with this study. So I'd love it if you talked a little bit more about that. You're on mute now. Yeah, so a couple, of, a couple of things about that, right? So first, we are a social justice organization that's on the ground in a lot of communities working to, you know, in police violence or hold people accountable for it, working to change laws around um, criminal justice. And so we're coming up against the narratives that come out of Hollywood every day. And so I want that to be sort of part of how I talk about this, because there can be a way that I like have a critique on media that's just about media for media's sake. And I want to say that as a person who wakes up every day trying to push for a less hostile and a more human world for Black people, that I am coming up against these narratives. For the last 20 years in this country, violent crime has steadily went down. But according to Pew Research, Americans believe that violent crime is going up. So we have a gap between perception and reality that is literally creating an incentive structure that's killing us, where people are making demands for a certain type of policing over other type of investments. They're making demands for a certain type of um, safety that doesn't impact them. One of the things in the report that we highlighted was just how few um, black women get shown as victims in these shows. And, what I, and how that impacts us is that we are working every day to change laws around um, criminal justice. And we end up in communities where only certain people get highlighted as victim rights advocates. And it's white women that get highlighted as victim rights advocates. And we know from study after study that black women want something very different oftentimes than white women um, when they're victims of crime. First and foremost, they want to make sure the person doesn't do it again. But oftentimes, they're much more likely to want things like restorative justice, to want investments in their communities around poverty, around mental health, around other things. Oftentimes, um, anyone who's a victim of crime is much more likely to know the person who victimized them than not. Um, and, and oftentimes way more likely than sometimes the TV shows will tell us. And so as a result, um, the reason why we did this report is because we really wanted to move outside of the anecdotal to have a broader understanding of the impact of the genre of shows. And so we brought on USC and they put together a huge code book that was, you know, 253 episodes. They coded for all sorts of different content. We got back to code book and I was like, ah, oh, man, like how are we even gonna display this? Um, and the research team, we really sat with USC to like try to figure out how we could tell a story of the impact, but also tell multiple stories because creativity is complicated and we didn't wanna just boil this down to science. And so we created a number of different indexes. One index was the good guy endorser index that really looked at when the good guy in the show does something bad and sort of defended, it's, it's sort of um, supported, the kind of in justifies the means. It's a narrative that we actually run up against when we're trying to deal with criminal justice, this gap between perception and reality where people think that the sort of uh, violence and surveillance and many of these things that are happening are necessary to keep people safe, violations of people's rights on the books, but only violations of certain people, right? I remember when we first were trying to get the TV show Cops, the reality show canceled back in 2013, 
um, Fox told me that um, they could diversify the images on air. And I kind of like, probably, I, I thought I laughed, I probably giggled. And I could just thought about like, oh, they want to, they picked the wrong racial justice organization if they think just showing more poor white people is gonna like make us happy going into communities that are still impacted by the war on drugs and poverty. And I responded by saying, if you're gonna take cops to Wall Street um, and Capitol Hill where crime happens that really impacts us at a deep structural level, sign me up, um, sign me up for that press release. But if you're gonna go into poor white communities, that doesn't really sort of help us um, at all and is not necessarily anything that we'll be happy with. And so I say that to say we, we looked at this, the good guy endorser index. We looked at the people of color endorser index, which is sometimes the ways that diversity gets weaponized against us, right? Diversity, and I really sort of appreciated what Gina said around sort of ensuring that um, as we, um, uh, diversify characters that they actually have intention. We have a, 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 um, a, a project called Tell Black Stories, which is very much about being kind of clear about the unique nature of black stories, because these shows have way more black judges than ever exist in the world. If you ever looked at a crime TV show, they have way more black judges. And I'm not trying to take jobs away from those brothers and sisters, but what would it really be like if there were that many black judges, black women judges, 65 and older? What would it say about education and justice system? But what ends up happening, and one thing we really looked at with diversity, is that overwhelmingly the writers rooms are white 81 percent of the writers are white so we have white writers sending justice through the mouths of, of sort of symbolic sort of black characters that have no backstory no intention and the public then is like believing that justice is actually happening on camera because they are seeing sort of a black person not speaking out, not pushing back, not saying anything about the justice system. When we know by and large, even when we see like uh, the image of um, a set of black women judges, all black women judges getting elected in Houston, those black women judges actually do things that are different when they get on the courts. They ask for different things. They're more likely to, to give people um, opportunities for um, alternatives to incarceration. Um, but what ends up happening is that the story, the intention behind the story is already there, and then they just paint diversity over it, which actually is hurts us more because it actually in the back in the people's mental model it gives them the thinking that um justice is okay and so we we did that and then the final thing we did was an, a racial integrity index and so different shows perform different ways because some shows are about different things but the racial integrity index was really looking back at um how what does the um, on air sort of diversity look like in in um, sort of relationship to the behind the camera diversity and because the crime TV genre has actually done a really good job of diversifying on air but many of the shows create this magical world where racial diversity exists at scale but racism doesn't and that racism is not sort of happening and that once again operates against us. And so the thing I'll just say is that we have this framework at Color of Change of not mistaking presence for power. And I think like this, I, I, I want to really make sure that I'm offering Color of Change up as a resource, whether it is the mobilization of our 7 million members, whether it is what we know from working on the ground that can be inside of writers rooms, whether it is just helping to amplify and support content that's coming out. But the thing about not mistaking presence for power is Oftentimes, we can think that diversity, visibility, um, shout outs from the stage means that we've changed the rules. And that when we sort of mistake presence for power, we sometimes think we've done something that we haven't done. So we will sometimes think because we've gotten to diversity that America loves Black people as much as America loves Black culture. And America can love, monetize, um, deal with Black culture and hate Black people at the same time and do all sorts of things to hold Black people back. And those two things don't actually have to be in conflict. And so this report for us wasn't um, the end of a story, but the ability for sort of us being able to take stock in what actually was on, on air so that we can then be inside of a conversation to both 
support creatives that want to be with us to help push for more diversity in writers rooms to help hopefully open up space so that even as we're thinking about the crime genre that an industry that can put people on other planets and an industry that can put people inside the planet can also dream of a world where we don't have police or could dream give us content that can give us over the hill imaginations because I really appreciated what Gina said and what I always think of is that it's really amazing for an industry like Hollywood who sort of pats itself on the back a lot during um, award seasons and I really want to sort of invite the producers on here to think about us as people that can push on the gatekeepers in ways that maybe others can't um, or in different ways um, but a, an industry that, um, like Hollywood, America had a black president before America had a sort of big budget black superhero. And that has to actually be something that we settle with in terms of what they give us to dream, what they give us in terms of images, that our democracy, which is so deeply flawed, our voting system, which is so deeply flawed, delivered a black president before we got um, Wakanda. I totally hear you. I think it is really important for the membership to understand that it's, I mean, taking what everyone said so far, it's about how we're represented, not the fact that you have, you know, I love that joke about the black judges because yes, um, or the black sergeant who's grumpy in an office who yells at everybody, that's the other favorite. But we're really, really lucky to have, um, and understand just for the audience, the number of black producer showrunners in television is very small. I mean, everyone knows about Shonda, obviously, and Ava, but you know, we're lucky to have um, Aaron Roshan Thomas with us, who is the creator of SWAT. And you know, I'd love for you to talk a bit, Aaron, about your journey with SWAT. I know that you are very familiar with the Color of Change folks. They've come to your set. Um, and in your instance, presence is power. <laughs> and I'd love for you to talk about how you navigate that and the creation of this show. Yeah, well, again, thanks for having us, Shelby. And I think this is obviously it's a vital conversation to be had. And it's one that I'm happy that we are having. Um, you know, I take things from everything that everybody is saying. And I feel like it's a combination, you know, of everything that we're talking about. Um, you know, when we're talking about, you know, not just having presence, but having power, what I always look at is how can we change that dynamic and gain the power that we need in order to change the conversation, to expand the conversation. And so, you know, I've been fortunate enough to rise up the ranks to write on a lot of different cop shows. Of course, being the only person of color in a lot of those rooms, you know, I've had the experience of of having to do the thing of, of code switching and figure out how to talk to white people and black people, you know. And what I've seen is, in, in, in my experience, has been that genre of the cop procedural has been around since the very beginning of Hollywood. You know, even before there were cop shows, there were Westerns, you know. In the silent film times, there was always the square jaw white dude right in the town. Back then, it was the Native Americans, we gotta get rid of them, you know. And, <laughs> So it's been a staple, it has been with Hollywood throughout time, and it's evolved over time into the urban cop trope, right? You know, Clint Eastwood kind of going from being a, a cowboy to, to being a cop. What I see is that there's potential for it to expand and to evolve even further. You know, we're in an age right now where we're in peak television, you know, there's more shows and projects on the air than ever before, and so, and I understand also how slowly Hollywood has changed over time. And so when I look at changing presence to power, I look at two dynamics that have to change in order to really change the content that's on our screens. We have to have more diversity as gatekeepers, the people that can actually green light projects, and we have to have more diversity um, amongst the, the content creators. It's ridiculous that, that on one hand, I can count the number of black showrunners who have ever run a cop show in the history of television, much less one that's created, you know, a cop show. Kevin Arkady helped create, you know, uh, New York Undercover some years ago, and I've, I worked with one of the few others who ran a show, Pam Bisse on CSI New York. Gina's done uh, Shots Fired, you know, 
Um, Venus Sud did seven seconds on, on Netflix. What I look at is, is a genre that has been timeless for Hollywood that has, hasn't yet expanded in a way that, say, like Major League Baseball did after Jackie Robinson got on one team. It became a much better product when the, the floodgates were open and there are different types of people that could actually play. And I think if we were to start with diversifying first the creators of content and definitely the gatekeepers, what I think you'll see is a diversity to the approach of storytelling. You know, not only the types of people that are represented before the screen, but who else is hired in your writer's room? If that person um, who's at the top is African-American and you've seen it from some of the examples that I just gave, that the attention to who's in your writer's room is very different. The types of people they're gonna wanna hire is different. The types of stories they're gonna wanna tell is different. If Gina directs an action movie and you know somebody else from the status quo directs the same action movie, it's gonna be a very different treatment. And so what I would love to look at are ways to actually empower us as storytellers and as producers of content and as the people who actually have the power to say yes or no, that's where it has to start. Anything short of that is gonna be window dressing or, or, you know, or stopgap solution, band-aids on bullet wounds, so to speak. Um, so what my effort has been definitely in my position on SWAT being a co-creator and also executive producer is to first start with our in-house, you know, to look at you know, what are ways that we can diverse, you know, diversify, make sure we're maximizing that as much as possible in our own rooms. And then look to mentor people who are looking to make the same, you know, you know, the same journey to, to try to, it, if I leave my post and I'm, and I'm done with my show and I haven't done anything to help my numbers increase, meaning what I represent, African-American showrunner in a space that is traditionally very, very white. If I haven't done anything to expand that, then I failed in my own job. And so to me, that's, that's what the priority is now moving forward. That's the opportunity we have in 2020 is that we have something that is awakened a conversation for everybody and there's no longer the excuse of ignorance or, or an idea that you weren't aware. You're now aware, you're now put on notice and now it's a matter of putting action to words. And, and that's where we all come in. That's really, really, really well said. Um, because I would imagine, like, I don't know, uh, you know, my friend Clark Johnson directed SWAT the movie. And then I heard that you were doing SWAT the TV show. So your relationship, like, how did that come about? How did you get that? It's, just, of, it's funny because, I mean, I mean, all of us probably know Clark. I know Clark from other stuff. Um, my idea, I mean, again, talking about like the, the, the state of our business, um, and I'm sure we can all speak to this and, and trying to get projects on the air. We're in that, we're still in that time of IPs, right? Like intellectual properties being the thing. And so if I'm being honest, my idea started with a character that I want to tell a story about. I want to tell a story about a black police officer who could be an action hero, but also could understand multiple sides of the debate of police and community uh, from the very beginning. Um, but I also realized that pairing that character up with the, an already established title is probably gonna get me further, at least at that time, than doing the untitled Aaron Rasan Thomas project, at least at this point. And so what I looked at is what's, what is a, what is a milieu, what's a world, world where that character would make sense and I would still be able to make him a kick-ass action hero. I grew up in a time where what we had, we had Shaft, who's a detective, and I love Shaft. And we had like Carl Weathers and like Action Jackson, and I think Keenan Ivory Waynes did like a Marine movie at one point, and then Wesley did like, you know, a couple of Blades. But there weren't any like black action heroes, you know, like so, that was a desire with this character it was, was to start off with a character who could have great conversations, tried as much as possible to make a difference in the world, but also give you, you know, some suspense, some action, that kind of thing. And so in looking at properties that, that where that would make sense, you know, what I saw with SWAT was an opportunity to pair my character with the world that would be controversial, it's militarized police. Um, it's also a world where, you know, the first, very first SWAT team was created in the city of Los Angeles. LAPD doesn't exactly have the greatest track record when it comes to black and brown people. You know, if I had to put them in a hornet's nest, LA felt like the right place to put it. There's a historical context of there being basically a, a, an unrest, you know, a public 
symptom of, of what is already an ongoing illness, probably every 27 years or so between Watts, Rodney King, and now this year, um, it felt like the best way to do it. And then on top of that, for any fanboys that might be particular, the main character of SWAT had already been turned black back in 2003 when Samuel Jackson played Hondo anyway. So for the, you know, the dudes in my protest that I can say he's already been black, get, you know, get on my face with that. I felt like it was a perfect marriage to do that with. And I, and we purposely approached it as, can we do a show that will be entertaining, high octane, but then also, you know, get into some subject matter that, that other shows in our lane don't tend to touch. Um, and it's a particular balance, but that, that was always the goal. And what we found ourselves in, that's where we exist right now, is that we're still kind of like the only show in that lane that kind of even tries to explore some of the topics we explore from, from immigration to, um, to, you know, police officers, when we're talking about um, LG, um, you know, talking about any kind of sexuality, any kind of gender differences, any kind of like racial differences within the LAPD. These are all things that we try to explore every single episode. Um, the ism, so to speak, classism, racism, sexism, that's kind of where we live. And, and so what we look at this now is, is an opportunity to kind of springboard off of 2020, further explore those types of, of elements and try to improve on them as well. Because um, what we have is an audience on CBS, which is where we air, that is made up of people that may not interact with black people very often. You know, I, I look at that as an opportunity, you know, not a burden. I think most shows, when we're talking about window dressing, and the reason why there are black judges and black bosses is because for some people that's their solution to the the you know to the idea of, of diversifying, right? It's to show black people, brown people as being dignified or intelligent. And what what I think most people miss the mark on is it's it's not about exalting black images and making us perfect in, in its own way, that's dehumanizing as well. It's about telling three telling stories about three dimensional characters. You know, why do we do the things that we do? Why do we feel the way we feel? Why, when we feel pain, why are we feeling it? If, we're, if we feel happiness, why are we feeling it? It's the why, that's the toughness, because that requires you actually to, to know and interact with people of color. And that means having people of color in your creative circle. And so for us, that's always the goal is to, is to try to maximize that as much as possible. And then me individually, I'm looking to try to maximize that even outside of the one you know, singular show. It's interesting, you and Gina both sort of dovetail in that, Gina, if I misquote you, please correct me, but both of you took these well-worn genres, right? The comic book, superhero movie, or the Western turn urban cop and infused it with your own uh, uh, point of view and whether that's with women, with characters of color and giving them a 360 kind of experience in that, in that entertainment world, um, which I think is exactly what we need to have more of. Um, Gina, I wanted to ask you a question because I liked what Aaron said and I think I know some of your mentees, but you've really, you and your husband have done a lot of work in terms of bringing people up in the business. I'd love it if you talk a little bit about that. I mean, it's, you know, it is absolutely what is necessary in this industry. We, I mean, it's, Hollywood is, is very relationship driven. Um, and it was not ever designed to let a large group of us in. So it's supremely important when you get through that door it's not about celebrating, oh, I'm the only one in the room. There's nothing to celebrate about that. Um, it's, it's really a reason to elevate and find someone else to bring, you know, bring through that door with you. So, you know, really for both of us, we've always felt that responsibility. And it's exciting for us to find a new voice um, and not just a new voice, but then a new voice who's got that grit and that hustle and that stamina um, to survive in this industry. And, uh, and have success. So uh, we certainly always look out for that um, because we need more voices. We need more diverse voices. Again, we are, we are not all the same. We don't have all the same stories. And the more stories that we can tell, the more we can show the breadth of our humanity. 
Yeah, um, I hope it doesn't embarrass you, but I know, you know, Lena Waite is always talking about her experience working with you and what a absolute life game changer that was. And I, I've always been so, I mean, I, and I know several other people, but it's, I think it's, that is so crucial. And I just wanted to highlight that because that's something I think um, I've tried to do, but I think um, everyone needs to do more of. Very, yeah, yeah it's crucial. Absolutely. And then um, the other thing I wanted to just kind of get your take on, which Aaron touched on, is this issue of the gatekeepers and lack of diversity amongst, genuine diversity amongst the gatekeepers. Uh, how, what's your experience? What's your, what's your, do you have advice for people in our, in our audience um, about navigating that as it currently stands? I mean, you know, I, Reggie and I, we've had some horrifying experiences with gatekeepers. I mean, stories that you, you would not believe, the things that people will say to your face because it does not cross their mind how offensive it is. Um, and, uh, you know, what, what just has to change is we have to start, I mean, we've said it a thousand times, but we you need to have more than just one point of view in the room. Um, you know, the majority of gatekeepers are white men. And so when they, when a project comes across their desk and they look at it, they're looking, do, do I identify with any of these people? Do I connect with it? Um, as opposed to me, when the old guard comes across my desk and there are all these different types of people in it, that's exciting to me. Um, and that, I mean, that's the shift that has to happen. The fact that I can go to watch The Notebook and just fall in love with those two characters up on screen. I obviously want an audience to feel the same way about Beyond the Lights and see two black people up on screen and, and just fall in love with the story and the characters. So um, we need more people in those ranks to green light, um, to just to change what is being put out into the world and uh, in this, the sameness. Um, and if you're not willing to bring, I can't even say that, you have to bring other people into the mix and into your production companies and into the studio ranks, um, into those suites, because uh, there are so many times that Reginald talked about going to a meeting and we walk all the way through to the, the head suite for the, for the meeting and we will not pass one person of color in the entire time. That's unconscionable. Look at your business, look around. If you have no people of color, you are doing it really, really wrong. Yeah, I, that's, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day and I said, you know, once you get past the guard gate and maybe reception. <laughs> You clear those two spots, <laughs> that's where it all ends. Thank you, that, that's, that's absolutely dead on. Um, before we open for questions, I just wanted to make sure that all of you feel, is there anything that you wanted to say to the audience um, or that, you know, before we get into some of the questions that, that, that people have? Is there any, I wanna make sure all of you feel like you said what you want to say. Rashad? Yeah, I guess the thing, the one thing I, I want to just say, I mean, the main reason why I'm here as a, as a person who's not a producer or a writer and not, is to really offer up color of change um, as a partner um, and as both uh, an organization that um, can be helpful in this space and, um, and is, you know, working to also learn um, as, we, as we continue to engage, which is why we do the research. And so change, changehollywood.org is the sort of platform that we do a lot of this work. You can also find it on colorofchange.org, but changehollywood.org is where you can find the report um, and other reports we've done and information on what we're doing. And, you know, the thing I want to just say to you is part of what we're, what we've consistently tried to do is build infrastructure to be able to be, um, you know, to like help move our aspirations and our vision of what type of content we all want to receive as people um, and also the conversations we're having with creatives um, into actual reality. Um, but in that process, we're doing a, a lot of ongoing learning, conversation and thinking. Um, and so just want to 
offer up changehollywood.org as a place that people can learn more about our work, but also, um, you know, my contact um, and contact of my team will be with uh, PGA for, um, you know, the, to go for it. That's great. Yeah, I urge everyone to go to your website. You can get the report. It's really worth reading, really um, dead on. So I would love to, and forgive me because I am not the most technical creature. And uh, so uh, Cynthia, did you want to, ah, there we go. Sorry. Yes. Hi. I'm such an archetypical girl. I'm like, ah, the machine. <laughs> I've come out from behind my headshot. Um, so yeah, we've had um, several questions have come in. Um, the first one um, that Shelby, I thought I could put to the panel is um, from an anonymous attendee. How realistic is it to think police procedurals will be reimagined industry-wide if there are so few people of color, showrunners and writers in the room? Can I, can I take that one? Not realistic at all. That's not happening without people of color being in a room. That's an easy one. That's why that has to change. It's one of the reasons why um, right now, it is a good question though, but it's one of the reasons why things have to change. And that's why conversations, I mean, as Gina indicated, these conversations have been had since the beginning of time, right? We've had these a billion different times. It's just in 2020, the hope is that we can actually put some action to words um, because there's a spotlight right now. If there's anything that Hollywood tends to respond to, they don't want to have conversations about race any longer than they are comfortable with, which is about 0 0.02 seconds, right? If this con conversation continues and there continues to be a spotlight, which is one of the reasons why you do panels like this, then hopefully we can extend that conversation. I'm a big believer that COVID has slowed things down in a good way in this regard, where there hasn't been the next hot topic that's come along where we could just sweep, you know, policing community under the rug and move on to the next thing, whatever it is, Oscar hopefuls or whatever the, the hell we'd be talking about right now. Because of that, I feel like let's stay on topic for as long as possible. Let's talk about this. And in talking about that and holding people accountable for the words that they say, the press releases that we're seeing, the question is always, okay, and what are you doing? Um, and I don't mean like just canceling shows, like what are you, what are you developing? Who are the people you're looking to hire? Who are you developing with? who are the people you're looking to get into business with moving forward. If your roster looks exactly the same, you know, a year from now as it did now, if, you, if the list of shows you have looks the same with the same types of people creating them, then we didn't learn a thing. We're a cancer patient who's getting no treatment whatsoever. Like you already know the symptoms. Let's actually treat this thing. And, and so to answer your question, it has to change. There have to be different types of people at the table and right now, there has to be leverage and, and pressure placed on all of us to make that happen. Uh, that was quite absolutely dead on. <laughs> totally nailed that one. Do you have a, another one, Cynthia? Yes. Um, so this question is from Tanya Hughes. How do production studios analyze their spaces and reform them so that they are truly safe and inclusive? Uh, could the person clarify safe? You meaning like... Um... So the question goes on to ask, something as little as band-aids for darker skin tones instead of lighter skin tone band-aid to stories that feature non-stereotypical three-dimensional characters to hiring black female producers and music supervisors. It also comes from the top down. It's all from the top down. You know, and it's, you know, at the highest levels, again, gatekeepers and the people who actually are in control of the projects creatively, but also the heads of different departments. You know, something as simple as having a black female leader in your show, but if you don't have anybody black in your hair department, they don't know how to actually, you know, what to do with black hair, that's a problem. You know, that, that can also cost you money for those who may not understand why that's a problem. Um, it's things like that, it's across the board. Yes, attention to detail with Band-Aids, with hair, with clothing, with, with food. Um, 
you know, everything across the board, being true to the representation on the screen means actually having truth behind the screen with the people who are in charge of the images and the stories we see and we experience. It has to all start there. I think that's true. I mean, that's why we need more black writers, showrunners, producers, people of color, because I loved what was said earlier, which is being black is always treated as a monolithic experience in America. It is not a monolithic experience. There are four black people on this, in this panel, and everybody has a very different experience of that, right? And all of those should be honored. And so far, the, what somebody once asked me why I made the, the movies and things I have, and I said, because those are the ones I could get made. Like, if I gave you the list of all of the things I couldn't get made, then it would be huge. But I think that majority culture is represented in all of its texture and glory, and the rest of us, uh, all of, you know, BPOC, LGBTQ+, uh, uh, Asian Americans, you know, everybody has stories. And if I can go to the farewell and love it and identify, so look at everybody else, right? Like there's a there's a world. And I think that's what we're all trying to say, what everyone's been saying is we need greater diversity. We need to bring, mentor people, bring them up and into the business, but the gatekeepers too need to change because notes as both Gina and Aaron have referred to, notes and gatekeepers can kill your project. If they don't understand it because they don't see it, then, <laughs> It won't get. It won't happen, or it'll happen in the way that they're comfortable with. Is that a, is that an accurate paraphrasing of what both of you said? I'll also just add from the documentary filmmaking space. As producers, we we're, since we're often independent, we really run little shops, and so I'm part of a group called the Documentary Producers Alliance, where we're consciously working to like make sure everybody, including there's other allied orgs of BIPOC filmmakers, like. How do the contracts work? How does the investment dollars work? Where do you meet the people who have the money? Where do you meet the people who make those decisions? Can you come to those parties? Can you bring them in? Because it's it is a small world and getting up the ladder. But then once you're getting there, do you have all the tools that somehow got passed back or we learned along the way? So can you level the playing field? Is that's a lot of the work the DPA is doing is how do we just spread the the nitty-gritty knowledge? Um, that you may not get so that you can open your own set and open your own production company and have the resources to hire folks. I feel like that's the role we need to play, which is share the share what you got, share the share what you learned. Um, so yes, the, absolutely, we need the gatekeepers to change because those decisions, you know, the money's always coming from there, but we can help one another, I think, more than had been happening for sure. Um, do we have time for one more or are we out of time? Seven o'clock, but we could do maybe one more. If it's a quick one, sure. Okay, well, there's there's two, and I would say that um, there's one question that's been a popular one, so I'll just put it out there, which is, what are the thoughts of approaching this genre through comedy? Which might be a corollary to uh, another question, which is now that programs such as Live PD have been canceled, what are networks looking to that are law enforcement based as an alternative? I think what networks are looking for, I don't, I, I personally, you know, we're always trying to sell things. I don't know. They kind of have their own, you know, I, I think that what Aaron talked about, about crafting a character and a world is a thing, but you know, that's one approach to it. Otherwise, I think the networks right now are shifting because all the ground is shifting because Rashad boosts, you know, that great work because people like Gina and Aaron are focusing spotlights on the gatekeepers and, who, and literally who are you in business with? Is it the same roster as you've had for the last five, six, seven years, right? So I think that, you know, short of getting one of them on here, I, unless Gina and Rashad, you know what it is you know, that networks are looking for right this second. The my conversations are that they're looking to figure out how to not get in trouble. <laughs> right, but I mean. <laughs> 
and maybe that's just the conversations that I end up in for obvious reasons. Um, so, um, and so that's not always the conversation I want to be part of. I would love to be in the conversation where I have them talking to um, young black folks about what they want to see and how they want to see themselves on air and how and and you know maybe us doing some focus groups around the country and then looking uh, for the type of content maybe you know connecting with the millions of multiracial people showing up uh, to protest around the country and what type of content they want to see the world is changing very quickly and changing under our feet and I think the rules are changing and I think continuing to name the problem the right way will also get us to the right solutions. And so it's not that black people are less likely to be inside of writer's rooms. It's that writer's rooms have been less likely to hire black people or have excluded black people. On one hand, we end up trying to fix black people with a lot of mentorship programs. On the other hand, we actually fix the structures that have excluded us. Black people are less likely to get documentaries greenlit rather than um, you know, those who greenlight are less likely to greenlight documentaries helmed by black people. On one hand, we do a whole lot of pipeline um, programs, literacy programs, things like that. I'm not saying those are not good. I'm just saying the industry has had decades of those things that haven't always ended up with better numbers. And I'm even in the, in the ongoing stories we hear. And so I just hope people continue to hear, tell ourselves stories that don't put black folks and black communities in the position of being remedial don't play into pejorative aspects of what we can accomplish but really deal with all the systemic barriers that have held people back and open up the sort of avenues for real opportunity and shall we uh, just to co-sign and, and and kind of add to that stop the narrative stop thinking that putting black people in your writer's room or, or, you know, in your executive suites is politically correct. It's, it makes your product better to have diverse voices in the room. Uh, someone asked about comedy. Absolutely. Ha comedy, um, the way that you come up affects your comedy. It affects the lens that you see the world through. When you have a diverse room, it's just adding to it. Um, so stop thinking this is a PC thing to do and I need to do the right thing. It's the right thing because it makes your show better. It makes your executive suite better. It makes your production company better um, to have differing voices in the room. I think that's a great note to go out on. That was, that's exactly right. I think them not wanting to be in trouble and do remedial is the opposite of what Gina's talking about, which is really holistic, embrace new voices rather than, you know, shun them. Great. Great. So, uh, well, I wanted to um, thank, thank everyone so much for coming tonight. And I wanted to thank Shelby, Marilyn, Gina, Rashad, and Aaron so much for this powerful conversation. Um, we're really grateful for your time and your thoughtfulness. And I also wanted to thank the planning team who were also, um, many people were part of putting this together. So thank you so much to all the team uh, who are behind this. And I also wanted to share with those of you who um, have feedback or comments, we wanted to welcome your feedback and comments. Um, please email diversity at producersguild.org if you'd like to share comments or feedback. And um, there are a few questions in the um, chat that I think we'll try and get answers to, to those of you who we can, who are looking for specific information. And um, thank you all. I really, really appreciate this great conversation. Thank you guys very, very much. So much. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Good night. Good night. Good night.